Welcome back, everyone. In the last lesson, we learned about what kind of questions we should ask in order to identify the constraints that affect our solution. In this lesson, we're going to switch over to the tablet and think about how do we turn these constraints that we've identified into proper test cases that we can use to guide our actual solution. So the first test case we should think of is our best case test case. This is an array and target combination with a really obvious answer. So let's say it's 1, 3, 7, 9, 2. This is our array and we get a target of 11. Here it's really obvious that the 9 and the 2 are the valid solution. There's no other numbers in this array that add up to our target. All of our numbers are positive and there are no duplicates. The next thing we should consider then is what about no solution? And what are all the cases that could come up where we have no valid solution, as we discussed when we talked about that constraint? Well, what we need is an array where there's no possible way any numbers add up to the target. So let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and let's imagine we have a target of 25. Here there's no possible two numbers that can add up to it. And we also have to account for the case where we have an empty array with any target. It doesn't even matter. And then we also have to account for if we have an array with one value that we can't possibly form a pair because as we know the question asks for a pair of values. And with this case we should also account for where we have one value but the target is equal to that value. So this is a great edge case because here we can see that the only value that exists is the actual target value. But because we're looking for a pair, this should automatically fail anyways. The only way this would be valid is if we had a zero in there as well, as a second value. Because then five plus zero form a pair that add up to the target five. So the last edge case we need to consider is maybe something like a low-hanging fruit, where we have a guaranteed solution as the only two values that exist in this array. So here we have one and six and a target of seven. 1 and 6 is a valid pair that add up to 7, but it's also the only pair in the array. And this way, we've kind of captured all of the possible constraints and edge cases we need to think about based on those questions we asked in the last lesson that will guide how we think about our solution. This brings us to our next step, which is where we have to figure out a solution without code. So before we think about any technical implementations or get bogged down by technical details, when we're given this problem, how would we rationally solve this? So here I've taken our best case that we came up with, which is our first test case. At the very top here, I've essentially just added the indices because as we remember, this question is asking us to return the indices of the valid solution. And I've also set the array to be equal to a variable called nums. You'll see why this is useful later. But what we need to do now is come up with a strategy. Just think about this problem. How would you do this? Well, normally if we just looked at this array, we see that the nine and two, very obviously, because we can do basic math, add up to the 11. But what if this array was really large? Or what if this target and the numbers inside were really big? Maybe our mental math isn't quick enough for us to either identify two values or even see a solution that quickly. We have to think about how we can break down what we just did into something more tangible. So a really easy thing, which is the most brute force solution, is just to compare every single possible pair of numbers in this array, and then just figure out which one adds up to 11. That way, if none of them add up to 11, then we know there's no solution. But at the very least, we know we've tried every single possible combination of pairs. The easiest way to keep track of what numbers we've tested is using a technique known as two pointers. All this means is that we have a pointer that points to one number that we're testing for every case first. And then we have a second pointer that points to the opposing number that might form a valid solution. So what we need to do is we need to come up with a general formula to figure out that if one of the numbers that we're using, so in this case, the number at P1, if the number here has to be part of what we're testing, how do we know that we found the correct opposing pair? Well, here we can say that the number to find that we're looking for is equal to the target 
minus nums at P1. So in this case, we know that the number we're testing for is 1. So nums at P1 is 1. The target here is 11. 11 minus 1 is 10. So the number that we're looking for is 10. So just remember that we're testing against every case where whatever a value at P1 is must be part of the solution. So this means that now P2, what it's going to do is it's going to scan across this array and every number until it finds one that matches this number to find value that we've got. So let's start with P2 at where it is when we initialized it. So the number here is 3. Is 3 equal to 10? It's not. So what we do is we move P2 forward by 1. And then we take this new number of 7 and we say, is this 7 equal to 10? It's not. So then we move P2 forward again. And then we say, is this number 9 equal to 10? It's not. So we move P2 forward again. Now, is this number 2 equal to 10? It's not. So once again, we've reached the end of P2, which means that we now know that we have tried every possible combination of numbers for P1. This means that there is no possible solution for this given target of 11 that could have 1 as one of the numbers in the pair. So we can just scratch that off. And what we now do is we move P1 over by 1. And now P2 points to the number to the right of P1, and we never have to worry about any number to the left of P1. Because as we saw, we've already tested every case that could have had 1 as its solution. 1 is guaranteed not to be in the solution. So we can completely ignore the left side of P1. So now we have to recalculate what our number to find is. So here, we know that our target is still 11. Our nums at P1 is now 3. 11 minus 3 is 8. And once again, we now do our check. Is the number at P2, which is 7, is 7 equal to 8? It's not. So we move P2 forward by 1. Is 9 equal to 8? It's not. So once again, we move P2 forward, and we check, is 2 equal to 8? It's not. So once again, we've hit the end with P2. So we now know that 3 cannot possibly be part of the solution. So we scratch out 3 and we reinitialize P1, and we move P1 over by 1. P2 also gets reset, and now we have to recalculate our new number to find. So here, target stays the same at 11. Nums at P1 is now 7. 11 minus 7 is 4. So now the number we're looking for is 4. Is the current number at P2, which is 9 equal to 4? It's not. So P2 moves forward by 1. And then we compare, is 2 equal to 4? It's not. So we've hit the end, and now we know we have to reinitialize P1 and P2. P1 now moves over by 1, but first let's scratch out the 7 because we know it can't be part of our solution. P1 is now at 9. P2 is now at 2. And we recalculate our number to find. So now we know that our number to find is going to be 11 minus 9. Number to find is 2. Is our current P2 value 2 equal to 2? Yes, it is. So we found a match. So now we know that the answer that we need to return is going to be our number at P1 and our number at P2. This then, of course, returns us an array with those indices of 3, 4, which is the correct answer. So now that we know the strategy of how we would solve this problem, let's turn this into code. And that's what we're going to do in the next lesson. Now, I actually suggest that you try this first. However difficult it may be for you, pick the preferred language that you have and see if you can come up with how to turn this into a code solution. If you can't, no problem. We're going to do it in the next lesson. So I will see you in the next lesson.